This is The Culture. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinema Wave Podcast. We are back for the third episode of season four of True Detective, subtitled Night Country. This uh, show is now, again, in its third week. We have three weeks after this one to go. I am one of your hosts. My name is Darian Scalamoni. I am joined, as always, by Zach Miller. How are you? How are you guys? I'm here for another episode. <laughs> All right, guys. First things first, this show sucks. No, um, that's not true. I don't know what to say about this episode. This is going to be an interesting talk. I don't know how long we're going to go. This show sucks. No. Um, here's the thing. Guys. It doesn't suck. It yet. doesn't suck yet. It was not giving us a good feeling, though. No, no. I, I think this is. Uh, I felt like they were trending in a direction mm. last week, and it led to increased viewership it led to a lot more speculation online it led to a lot of commentary from fans and this week it's a giant clusterfuck and i don't know i'm gonna start by being somewhat harsh and i don't really care go for it uh i think the writing in this season is poor especially Mm -hmm. in consideration of what has come before it and we were talking with producer liz for this episode about this off camera. She asked a very poignant question. So thank you, Liz, um, about if this show was not titled true detective, would we feel similarly? And Mm. I definitely think it plays a part in it because there's such an established, um, feeling that you hope to get with what comes with a franchise, especially one that was born with such an incredible debut season that, You always have your expectations in some sort of way, right? But then, as we talked about in last week's episode, you add a connective tissue to said first season, and it kind of makes your brain just go all over the place. This episode solidified a fear that I've had since the first episode, which was you have your two lead characters of Danvers and Navarro, who are very one-note characters, are very similar characters, And I don't think that Issa Lopez, who wrote and directed this season, has done a great job of establishing them as characters. What do you think about that criticism that I just laid forth? Yeah, I I think uh, another point that we were talking about is that my fears are also starting to come true. Like, we're running out of time for there to be new avenues that they go down at this point. I think the way they've set things up now, it's three episodes in. You, I was really hoping for a better established side storyline along with the main case that's going on, but instead they keep holding back information and I think they're waiting until this payoff or climax at the end of the season to, to let everything flood, like all the floodgates to open, to let all the details out. And with Navarro and Danvers, it feels very repetitive and very redundant that we understand they both have some traumatic past. They have traumatic history. Um, they both have what's supposedly uh, kids that they lost or siblings that they lost. Like in this episode, Navarro has a flashback that we can get into later. But, um, you know, it's a lot of like withheld, built up anxiousness and um, like resentment towards the rest of the community and I, at this point it's episode three now we really needed a little bit more of the backstory to understand that resentment and that mistrust in each other and how jody foster is just an absolute stone wall to everybody around her and i really didn't expect her to be this harsh and critical especially when she knows she has all the odds working against her and the amount of staff that she has and um, the belief that her community has in her is very slim. So she's trying to prove herself, but yet she keeps pushing them out, which I have not understood, but I would understand it more if we had that exposition, but instead they're doing cop outs to flashbacks and cheap flashbacks, very limited yeah. flashback as well. Like there are moments where you get very quick glimpses of stuff for, I think the sake of, um, trying to uh worry the viewer trying to get them in a different sort of mindset which we also talked about within the first two weeks with the supernatural elements um 
Isa Lopez, I didn't know prior to reading an article today, but I found out that she comes from the horror genre. Okay. And that makes a lot more sense to me. 100%. Because I think the things that work for this show are the supernatural elements and the visual imagery that is horrific works really well. But we mm. haven't seen that before in True Detective. And originally we were like, that's a very interesting foil. That's an interesting avenue yeah. that they can go down. Now, the other part of what makes True Detective so great, even in the seasons that might not stand up to maybe the first season with McConaughey and Harrelson, is the chemistry and the connective tissue that is the detectives. Um, right. And I mean, even Stephen Dorff and, and Mahershala, you get you get that in season three. Mm hmm. This, you're not getting much of it at all. And I do, I have an exact pull quote uh, from an article, a review that was written from Collider. And I do want to, this was perfectly summarized. And this is exactly how I feel. So I, I don't want to want to give credit where credit is due. So this is from Eliza Guimarez, who was recapping episode three on Collider. She said, there's just so much that we can stand of Danver and Navarro's nonstop humorless banting without getting tired of it. And episode three does not seem to be aware of these limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very true because we're getting so much of these stonewalled characters where we're not digging deeper. And it's starting to become a point where as a viewer, you're you start to ask yourself, why, why do I care? Right. And exactly. That's never what you want as a viewer for the no. people who don't know that. Like, no. if you ever had that feeling in your head where you're like, why do I care about what's about to happen? That means you're not doing your job as a showrunner mm. and or, or a director or a writer. And I'm worried because, like you said, like this was really the week where we needed to sort of see that happen mm. um, because now we only have three episodes left. And we're halfway through the show. There's only three left. It's only six episodes total. I thought it was eight. Oh, my god. I'm gosh. pretty positive. It's, I'll double check. I'm not sure. It is. It's six. All right, so we have one. We have an episode uh, next three. week, and then we have a break. So we a have break? Well, one for week, what? A one week. Well, break. a break from what? They haven't told us anything yet. They've told. Okay, so this is the first episode where I believe don't they find the bodies at the end of episode one? Like that's how. Yeah, the clip. Yes, the the the, corpse, yeah. the corpse sickle. The cor like originally in the ice. Yes. Yeah. So yes, they, they find did. them and they open up on it in, in episode two. Yes. Yeah. So they found them there. We have basically not covered much more ground in those two episodes of at least the case. Like they are looking into details, but that could have been ten minutes of one episode. Yeah, just the details that they've covered. Yes, and you only you only get so we spend so much time in episode two with the corpsicle thinking something is going to happen, and then you get the reveal in episode three that the um uh. Uh, I'm looking for the right terminology here. The person who's going to inspect the bodies. Do you oh, know what the oh, type the of coroner and cor uh, yeah, think, but, yeah. It, but I think it's somebody. It might be medical examiner. Yes. Yeah. So either coroner, medical examiner. Yeah. They're they're trying to get this expert in to e examine the bodies, mm. and they can't make it because of a snowstorm. So they bring in the the vet. The vet. Yeah. And you get you get one you get a three minute scene, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. So then you also wasted all that time really involving them. And so much of that, again, revolves around the horrific nature of what the visual is right. rather than focusing on the character development and the actual development of the story. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the writing is just very quickly sliding. It's getting mm -hmm. to a point where it's going to become, I mean, we're frustrated. Like we, we, we had high expectations for the show. We had, expectations throughout the first two weeks where you thought they were leading us down a path. And then this episode is just like a whimper and yeah. there's not much like I, my favorite part of this whole entire episode is the last thing we say. And again, that's very 100%. much a yeah. visual image. Like that's an imagery thing. Mm -hmm. It's because we're getting a crazy image of this dude, literally like <clears throat> screaming at the top of his fucking lungs. And then he rises back up from the hospital bed and he's like, mm. they're coming for you. And you're like, what? Like, we woke her up. What the fuck? We woke her up. Yeah. And I was like, okay. All right. So to your point there, it's, I mean, I will be even more upset if they go against what they've set up now. So they've set up that this is probably paranormal at this point, something supernatural, something voodoo related. Like yes. they keep hinting at these things and the symbols and the significance of that and the backstory 
I mean, the guy, like, we'll get into spoilers now, but, like, the the guy, the only victim that was left, and they knew how important this testimony was. I, I called it, too. I knew he was going to be, they were going to go to the hospital. They were going to try and talk to him. Not exactly what was going to happen, yes. but I knew they were going to go, like, question him in this episode. Oh, and then, um, like, he's he's doing all these, like, muttered words. And, I mean, the guy was, like, suffering. He, got, he had to amputate his two legs because of the um, hypothermia yeah, and everything. Yeah. Um, so he's like going in through shock and then, um, as everyone leaves the room for some reason, the hillbillies are fighting in the hospital I, that like did not make sense to me either. No. Um, there was no explanation for that. It was just to pull them out of the room and Navarro sees him sit up. His eyes look almost possessed and he's like, we woke her up and your mom wants you to come with to come with us yeah, or yeah. something like that, you know, <clears throat> like explaining that the dead are out there and like, we're coming for you all that type of situation. Yeah, yeah. So feels very cheap. It just felt like, but that was the most intriguing part. Like I want, which is sad. <laughs> <because it's laughs> it not, was like, the last two minutes I was explaining to Liz. Cause Liz hasn't seen any of the show, but like it, it felt like every, like you said, filler in between the last two minutes, very intriguing. Even the uh, the corpsicle stuff, the the vet is like, oh, they didn't die of of freezing; they died of cardiac arrest. Yeah, they, they were like, afraid something of something. Scared them. Yes. I've seen this in Caribou. Like, yes. I can't say for certain, but their hearts stopped. And, and then, so, and so that at least, and like you're saying with the Caribou <clears throat> reference too, which we mm. we talked about uh, the opening of the series. Right. Yeah. You get the Caribou just leaping to their death off off this mountain from nothing, or what we think is nothing. Which <clears throat> all of it is going to lead back to this eventual thing, but um, I don't I don't know if it's worth sacrificing your lead characters for because it's 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 almost like she's trying to restrict the audience of what comes before it to try to heighten the stakes of what we're dealing with in the meantime, but that's five minutes of every episode right of a 40 minute or longer like episode by episode arc that we're getting and mm -hmm. like you said before it's just getting really redundant and it's not really interesting mm -hmm. because we don't really care about mm -hmm. the characters um you know what I, I found the tropes that have like recurred very okay. often okay so it's like danvers gets pissed at pete for no reason mm -hmm. pete is trying his hardest Pete and his wife have an, a confrontation like, oh, this is affecting the family. He's like, I know, I know. And then he goes back to the case and he's like, I want to be a cop and I want to prove myself. It's like, OK, Pete, good for you, bro. I'm actually rooting for Pete. I'm rooting like <laughs> Pete is a good character, but this keeps happening. Like, we I get it, man. Like, we get it. This is pulling you away from your family. We've seen that in the last two episodes. Number three, John Fox's character. John, oh hank we don't get much with hank, hank every is episode. very like why'd you do that why'd you take my stuff man you know like we're hot like like hey you can't take that stuff or like oh maybe she did have to like he is a police officer saying ominous stuff and he's rebelling against the chief doing whatever he wants and that bothered so that bothered me the most with this episode because <clears throat> they have a legitimate this was the this was the most interesting thing to me story wise that we've gotten through three episodes, mm -hmm. but they don't capitalize on it. So Danvers and um, Navarro find a picture of Annie with Raymond Clark while yes. they're in the office, and it looks like it's taken by somebody else, and the photo is tainted with uh, blue ink that she has in her hair. So they go to question the hairdresser, and they think that um, like she had something to do with or knowing something about what happens with Annie. And the hairdresser, uh, when she gets asked uh, by um, by Navarro, Navarro yeah. uh, about it, she goes, when they were investigating the murder that uh, she found out, that she told Hank previously, John yeah. Hawks' character. She, yeah, yeah. she told him all the details already, and he just like, who did you talk to? He did not he... tell anybody about the mm -hmm. details of what happened. That is sketchy as fuck. Withholding evidence, yep. Mm -hmm. And all that happens is she throws water in his fucking face. Yep. That's and Navarro says that too. She's yes. like, "That's all you're gonna do. Yes. You're the chief of police, and that's all you're gonna do." So she's like, "Ah, the, 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 great Jodie Foster impression." <laughs> she's like, ah, yeah, well, literally, I don't know. I got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, whatever." So 
That pisses me off. It's just like <laughs> it pisses me off too. It's lazy writing, and it, they're not doing anything that is benefiting the characters. They're not doing anything that is progressing the story. And now, like I agree with your reaction. Looking at IMDb and seeing that we're going to do one more episode and then we're going to give a week break before we jump back into it is a bad fucking idea. Unless something happens in episode four that completely turns us around, that's a bad idea because the show is trending in the wrong direction and you're going to lose momentum very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I am curious. I wish I knew the numbers. Like I'm, I'm, I wonder mm. how the show is doing week to week. I, I don't know if it tampered all. I mean, yeah. this is going to be the big teller. I feel like yeah. after this episode, like, I don't know about you, but like, I heard this a long time ago from, from somebody that was on YouTube and I, I never applied it until I heard them say it. Now I use it for yeah. all my shows. You give a show three episodes. Like that's your, that's mm. your platform. Like Liz right. and I only didn't do that with the idol because that show was unbearable. But like, usually it's like, I will give a show three episodes. And if I'm not on board by then, then I'll bail. Now I'm not going to do that with this show because we're covering it. And because we want to see the conclusion of what happens yeah. with this. If I wasn't, if we weren't covering this for the channel, I might have, I might bow out mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm so annoyed with the fact that you're not trying to even hook us anymore. And it's obvious with the choices that you're making as yeah. a writer that you, you're just trying for the shock value, right? Especially with the last two minutes of every fucking scene that has happened, all three episodes, they're all cliffhangers. Yes, every single one is a cliffhanger, which is so cliche and it's bullshit. And HBO is better than that. And I don't yeah. know why we're doing that. Yeah. So you notice the cliffhangers more too because of all the filler, like simple nothing things. Nothing else is appealing. Nothing happens. Yeah, like nothing it's all these appealing. conversations. It's nothing to set up the case itself. It's nothing like, oh, I found details on this guy. Let's introduce another new character <clears throat> that's sketchy. There are – another thing I think they screwed up is there are no other potential suspects. Like there are – there is only Hank that is like – you're trying to figure out what his role is in the thing. Mm. The whole mix with the mind situation, which they've already figured out now, episode three. And even Navarro was kind of figuring that out, episode two. Yeah. She's like, the mind, people probably ganged up on Annie, killed her, could be a similar situation here. Clark is involved. Could be something like that. Hank is clearly hiding something. Everything feels a little too obvious except the supernatural elements so far. I will say another couple things. Another recurring elements is um, Danvers' um, daughter, who is the rebellious teen. Like, okay, A that's walking great. cliche. Awesome. And another walking cliche, Navarro's sister. She is an emotional sympathy trope because, okay, how does that, how does her mental health have anything else to do with the rest of the plot? Nothing. And her, and, if if they want to put her in like a home and then she like talks to another person that's related to the murder or like that would be cool like something has to be relevant to the story but they're using her as like oh i feel bad for navarro because she's going through so much it's like you're not even folk you're not even giving justice to her sister it's just like her sister has a lot of turmoil going on but you're using that as an emotional sympathy for navarro and then the same thing for danvers is like oh yeah feel bad for danvers her kid died in a car accident but we're not going to show that it's like and you don't okay. really cover it at all like not right. even i mean even it's one thing to not <clears throat> even show it or like it, it's not talked about you get these very little flashbacks and that's another weird thing with it like despite the fact that jodie foster's role in this show and danvers as a character in general is someone that is like you've alluded to and you've talked about in this episode that we're recording that she's very standoffish and that there's literally nobody who's like gives a shit about her in the whole town. She's fucking magical with children. Every kid she's fucking true. come across. Mm -hmm. She has the, she's been appealing to the kid. She's catered to the kid. She, and she acts differently, which I actually applaud Jodie Foster for, for doing fucking something different. And yeah. I mean, I guess that's one thing that you can applaud the writer as well, but it's like at the same time now, we have no explanation on why that is. Yes. Like most people, if you're a shitty person, you're not just going to be good to kids. You're usually just going to be shitty to everybody. Like right. that's usually what happens. Mm -hmm. So especially if you lost your own kid, yeah, like, you'd want to be you. Even if you're not shitty, to, uh, like outwardly shitty to other kids, you you want to be isolated. You don't want to be around other children because it'll make you think about what you lost and like. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I I don't I don't know what they're aiming for with this show 
I don't know what they're aiming for with what they are trying to appeal to with the audience. And I think also the pacing is a big fucking problem with the show because <laughs> the way that they are. And we talked a little bit off camera about this. The first three seasons of True Detective. They go where they jump uh, time periods and, and they do it in a way where sometimes it's a little jarring, but it makes sense for the plot. And it, it uh, you had talked yeah. about it, that what happens in the past definitely serves uh, the well present. to what happens yeah. in the present. So Issa Lopez had talked about how like there was a question. I think it was Variety that put it out and it was an interview when they asked her about that. And she was like, yeah, I toyed around with that idea. But again, I just thought that showing like these little flashes might have been more appealing and tried to keep us within what we're trying the story we're trying to tell. And that's fine if if you don't want to play into a part of what is like the new become the nucleus of what makes true detective true detective. <laughs> but again, it goes back to what I said previously that scares me about the fact <laughs> that this is so obviously not meant to be true detective. And yeah. you could have just made it your own show and you didn't have to go through all these rewrites and all these potential changes. Like, I don't know what her original script for the show looked like. The show was probably called North Country, like if I had to guess. Mm. And we don't know what that looks like. Now, part of it is like, did they do that because they know that people would have bowed out quicker if it didn't have True Detective attached to it because the writing isn't the best like i don't know <clears throat> i think it also suffers because it's trying to fit the mold of true detective now along with it doing his own thing i think it's it, it had it going for it in the beginning where it was adding new elements with like the horror and like some unsolved questions in the beginning and that's how it should be in the beginning mm. of any season of true detective this season they <laughs> decided to dive into more horror elements which is fine but when it's becoming unanswered or or it feels redundant or like I, I, every episode of the other seasons has a climax or a momentum building. Like the storylines have momentum to it. This dies every single episode. It like has a mounting momentum to the cliffhanger of one, two, and three. And then it starts right back up again, very slow, the next episode. Like, this episode, I thought was going to start right off the bat, like, a little bit faster, a little bit more interesting. But then they take time to go down the side storylines that are not They start with a flashback, don't they? They start with the flashback of, of um, uh, Annie having the child. <coughs> oh, Is yeah. Is that how the episode I opens? I think it, uh, yes, seven, the seven years earlier, yes, right? which and also gonna... was... was confusing timeline wise to me and i know you even yeah. have the title card but it still felt like it was the exact same time it did it just didn't feel like it, and that's also getting muddy now is annie's timeline of like what she did when she was alive too and how she was outspoken and then they had a very like super different scene like she was helping the community by having like home childbirth mm. for that one uh that one group of people I, there was there was like a reason that they did it like i think as uh natural as possible i think that's what they were trying to show us yeah. but it was and then she's like oh well now you can take me i'm gonna help these people first and she and navarro was gonna arrest her so i don't it just didn't feel like you needed that yet or that might pay off when we find out more about annie but for right now, it doesn't help. That's a big thing you know? with pacing, too. It's yeah. like you could have chosen a different point in time in which to show that scene, and that's why it felt so confusing to the viewer. And so, I don't. I mean, the word's not off-putting, but it just didn't fit. It didn't fit, fit right with the narrative overall, right. I didn't think. Um, <clears throat> and we do, so we get another supernatural scene that comes later, and it's another thing where it doesn't really feel very impactful because yeah. we don't really care about these characters but it's when navarro falls on the ice and she gets transported oh, that was stupid so yeah I, so... I just didn't like that at all like go period. off dude tell me dude, why you I hate just... it dude <clears throat> she's wandering the ice <clears throat> by herself she has an orange in her pocket she throws it out into the darkness and the orange rolls back and I'm like, what is she hallucinating? Like what? And then she just goes, 
and then walks away and then it cuts away to another sequence and it comes back to her again she's still wandering the ice and then she she thinks she sees a figure in the distance slips caught of course of course it happens like of course oh i slipped oh my god i'm on the ice this whole time i slipped oh now i'm unconscious maybe it's 20 years earlier or something i don't know so whatever whatever that was and then it's a flashback of a car accident like a truck or something in a desert and then there's a girl and i think she's saying like mommy or something like, no i, I think no it's idea. i think it's it's supposed <clears throat> it's supposed to be uh dan versus son are you sure? I'm pretty because I yeah, thought it was like a because, sibling of her. Because I think it's her son because he's holding the bear. The one-eyed bear that she has. Remember the one-eyed plush, the polar bear plush? Yeah, but I just don't understand the connection well, now. Like, That's I know. the problem. Well, this is what yeah. I'm talking about. Like I would have never thought of Guys, that. Guys, if you have been watching this whole time, this show sucks. We made that very clear <laughs> in the beginning. Um it has a lot of potential. It has like a lot of everything is there. They just choose to talk about the wrong things in the setup. It just doesn't make any sense. And then somehow they're just like another. Okay. Another, another really like couple bad details. They finally go and uh, they try and like go after that guy, Oliver, who is a nomad uh, to, to cock, right? That's yeah. His last name. Yeah. Yeah. Which they, is also, that was, I, I have that in my <clears throat> notes. They go from trying to focus on Hank and Navarro gets mad to then just going off on somebody else. Right. Meanwhile, Hank has gathered a militia of hillbillies hunting. <laughs> like literally, like right, they are, right. he's like, oh, all right, all right, guys. Like all the hunters in the town have their shotguns out with their dogs. And they're like, all right, guys. We got to find this You guy. go this way, you go that way. Yeah, yeah. He's gathered the morale of the police department to go looking for stuff. So you can tell he's obviously with a group of people trying to, potentially cover up Annie's murder and Clark's murders of indigenous people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then whoever's related to the, the station and whatever Annie was speaking out about and yeah. Annie's group. Now we've seen Annie's group of people with Danvers, daughter, but yeah, Hank got some hillbillies and uh, that's not good. But then they go looking for Oliver Danvers. Couldn't care less about the hillbillies. Yeah going off with their shotguns and oh yeah this might affect the town if they start doing something rash oh yeah i'm the chief of police i didn't think about that oh it's crazy and then now let's go find the nomad on the ice that's named oliver that i also talked to another nomad in a shack oh he knows a guy oh he knows a guy on the north shore let's go to the north shore <laughs> they find him the one guy has a knife when they greet them, okay, I am two, one state police officer and a chief of police. Neither of them draw their guns. No. Nope. Neither of them. And then they go up to the door. They enter it. The man is sitting in his chair with a shotgun. They do not do anything urgently like, sir, put the gun down, like whatever. He just goes, you're trespassing. They're like, oh, is this your house? Like whatever. Like, do you know about this? Like people die in the lab. And then he's like, oh, that's, cra like, that's crazy. I didn't know. I'm like, you guys got to go. You guys got to go. Then they leave. This guy was the only lead that they had. The only lead. And he just pulled a gun on you. And you're not going to do I think part anything. of that, again, I, this is why I think I think the writing is so poor. And I think another part of it is I, I think that <clears throat> I, I hope if I can see any sort <clears throat> of reasoning why the writing is the way that it is. Mm. But I don't agree with it. It's that. Lopez is trying to basically paint for the audience that this is the way that the town is. Yeah. And like, they're just so accustomed to this being the norm, but it, to me, it's shitty writing. And I agree with you. It's, it's, it's so crazy to be in that position as two major people within the police, their own police forces and to not follow any sort of lead within the whole episode that we get here. I don't really know where they go from here. I don't know how they keep the audience on board with it. I don't know who would not be upset with this episode as a whole. It's just the plot points too. It's like, it's, you know, like I can get past bad dialogue sometimes and I do like, I will still watch the show, but the way that the plot is laid out is very fragmented, very scattered. 
I'm not seeing things add up. Like in a crime show, it has to add up, or like there has to usually be a reason for this. Or if you're going to false lead, or yeah, yeah, like if you're going to present something mysterious, <clears throat> you have to have something that people give a shit about, yes. or else they don't even care about the mystery anymore. Yes, they really are just sitting there saying, "All right." I mean, I guess that was cool, like to see somebody stand up out of the bed, even though they basically were like dying. And yeah. then they say one thing and then he flatlines. It's a cool shot. It's very reminiscent of something that you would see in a horror film. And you'd be like, wow, that's a crazy mm. visual that they just gave us. But it's been done before. It has been. It's it, Like mm. you said, redundant is like the perfect word to describe it. And lackluster. Like, I think that the writing is genuinely lackluster. It's just, it's just hollow, you know, like, like there's a lot of motive and stuff, like not really there and present, I think, in, in the characters, like. You were also saying too how they are becoming just like statues of themselves. Like they're they're not really changing much at all. Especially Jodie Foster. There's She's no not, development. No <laughs> development. And that's like essential to the detectives in the other seasons. No, yeah, I, I totally agree that it just feels that again, you're underwriting the character so much that there's there's no like real stakes or motivation to root for them. And there's also, I know you talked a little bit, there's a confusing part that like, again, you don't really get full exposition on what it is, but they're compare, they're comparing what happened, what opens the episode where you get the natural, um, well, you get the home birth. And then the first thing is you think the baby's dead yeah, because the baby's not yeah. crying and, and they revived the <clears throat> baby. And then you compare that to what's happening in present day where, um, Dan versus daughter is going to, uh, I don't know if it's like a um, – there's definitely like another word for it. But like the only thing I'm thinking of right now is like sitting Shiva because they're not like a – they're not like a funeral and it's not Jewish. But I know that like when you sit Shiva, it's like a thing where you just kind of um, acknowledge that someone is gone without like fully diving into what comes with a death. Yeah. And I think that's so much of what that is similar to their uh, culture, the, the the native people and the, um, the indigenous people within the town. Right. Um, and yeah, it's like, that's just not really explained. And yeah. I think even like, it's scary because at least if maybe your main characters are underdeveloped, it's like, oh, well, maybe they're taking the time to focus on like a side character. Right. And it's like, they're not doing that. Like, you're like, yeah, I'm rooting for Pete. But he, and I like Pete's character is fine to root for. But like, the only thing you're really rooting for with him is that he's just getting a bad rap. Like he yes. has a bad dad. He has a shitty uh, relationship with his wife because he's trying to be dedicated to his work. But the chief of police also doesn't give a shit about him. And his yeah. most memorable moment of the whole season is a TikTok scene with Danvers' daughter. That's not good. That's not great writing. No, no, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I'm 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 very skeptical. <laughs> I'm very skeptical. Another another bad part of writing in this episode was um, they are literally like. <laughs> doing the classic like car dialogue that's in the other seasons like you think they're going to talk about the case and they actually pause talking about the case and Danvers gets a notification on her phone and Navarro goes oh what's that is that the lab she's like no it's tinder and I'm, and she's and she's like what which tinder? is which is similar to the first episode mm -hmm. when she gets a notification on her phone and because something about the case she goes ah fantasy football it's like, dude, why are you trying to pose as like a millennial, like, like, or well, you're adding it's if not you're relevant. Yeah, it's relevant. It's very yeah. if you're trying to like play and cater toward some sort of audience with those two little bits of dialogue, it feels very forced and yes. it takes you completely out of the scene in general and the stakes of what they're actually going through. Like, <clears throat> like uh in season one, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it is hard to compare it because it's like they're so different. But like if you're going to shoehorn it in the franchise, then you have to be fair and compare it to previous seasons. Right. But like in, in the first season so much uh, and there, it's not very humorous, but in the moments of humor that are within the first season, it's way more about uh, how like existential and like poetic McConaughey's character tries to be. And then what he's just like, you're a fucking weirdo, dude. And that yeah. leads to like moments of hilarity because you're just like, this is so funny. Like I can imagine like yeah. being in a car with this guy for fucking hours and he just goes off about shit. And you're like, what the right. fuck are you talking about? Yeah. This they're trying to be like culturally relevant with characters that, again, you don't really care about. And it feels like the dialogue is just not great. It has nothing to do with anything, anything like 
the also the biggest theme of this show too is how isolated and cut off they are from their surroundings and like what we think of as like normal like um suburbs and like everything like that like there there's no like big population or cultural things like other parts of the united states so when they're bringing in outside alaska stuff or like just big broad things like tinder's a big broad thing like fantasy football big broad thing that's not the first thing i'm going to think of when i'm in isolated alaska like like okay all right what why are we talking about the rest of the outside world when you're setting up how these people are so isolated they're in coverage of night like all that cloak and dagger goes away when you bring in these artificial themes of like the real world and like like you that's so separate from the narrative they're trying to set up yeah you want to be captivated by the actual story and they don't have anything captivating about the writing so it's not kind of holding your attention it's the same thing with the tiktok thing i was like it, it wasn't even a girl yeah. that was like now, getting I'm, I'm murdered. Literally, I'm was... literally realizing now that you're saying this that every single episode has that moment. Fantasy a footballs. Pe- in, yeah. If the first episode, the TikTok, and the second episode, and the third episode, you get the Tinder thing. It's like, and and it's not even like one of them is like, oh, I want to run away and like get out of here, like get out of this. You know, like at least they could acknowledge that they're so isolated. You know, and they want something more. It, it couldn't have even been. That's even cliche, but at least but it would have helped more. It. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I don't know. Um, and then they again, we like the cliffhanger that we have in this episode beyond the the haunting weird thing with the guy that the amputee, the only living suspect from the corpsicle, um, is you get the um the video of Annie's death, which they come across, and it ends with this crazy blood curdling scream and Mm. keeps us into the cliffhanger as well. And that's something that if the writing was good of the show, I feel like we'd be like going into next week being like, that's like, that's legit. Like that's a legit piece of evidence. And we're finally getting to a place where they have now obtained video footage of her being murdered. Like that's substantial. Right. But I don't give a fuck at all. Sorry, wow. fictional Annie. I don't give a fuck that you're dead mm. because I don't care because the writing is not good. So I, I don't really know what else to say because I think that we've done enough of painting a picture. I'm very curious what the audience thinks. Like if, if, for the people that have watched our previous two episodes and that are watching this show, please let us know what you think about this episode because I have no fucking idea where this goes. This is a major drop off score wise for me. I agree. Me for, too. For the last two yeah. weeks. Um, I mean, I guess before we get to scores, unless there's anything else you want to talk about, um, we, we, we tried, we started last week kind of asking like, who do we think is, is the perp is the perpetrator for, for what's happening. I don't really give a fuck anymore, but for the sake of keeping it going, who do we think it is? Again, we don't get any new suspects this week, which is kind of shocking. That's just, Oh, 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 before, sorry, before just <clears throat> yes. real quick. Another big thing that I was a little upset about is they shelved the whole um, Rustin Cole's dad. Oh, thing. yeah. We didn't talk about it. Completely yes. gone. I felt like it was fan service. That just felt like, okay, all right, let's give it to the fans that there's a connection here. Yeah. I hope it comes back up in the spirals. I will be pissed about it. I also, I want Fiona Shaw in the show more. <laughs> she's she's yeah. the only character. Like, and, and I, I want to start by, like, I think Jodie Foster is a fantastic actress. I really genuinely do. <clears throat> I th- was excited about the fact that she was going to be leading a season of True Detective. And I like mm. being able to see her in an environment that we kind of saw with Silence of the Lambs where she thrived, right? As playing a, a cop. Right. There's not much there with her portrayal mm. of this character. Again, I don't know how much of that is her. I don't know how much of that is the writing. Fiona Shaw was the only character... Uh, her her character, who I, I don't remember her name because she's only really been in. I mean, she was in a little bit of episode one mm. and then episode two. Um, but her character is the only one that I'm interested in hearing talk mm-hmm. because and part of that might be the fact that they just shoehorned a whole Rust and Cole plot line. Mm. Like, I don't know if that's so much her acting ability versus th- the creators of the show being like, we need to have some sort of connection to the past. Mm. So I, I don't know, but I agree with you. I think it's I think it's crazy to introduce something of that scale and then just completely neglect it. We also do we even get a spiral in this episode? They they reference it again. They say but like we don't see pictures. anything else. They have pictures like, oh, here's here's a tattoo. Like they're showing it to more 
cops and stuff yes. like that. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's the same thing. I'm like, yeah, we know yeah, that we know already. That already. <laughs> like, I get it. Like, and <clears throat> the people you're telling it to are really not helping you in this case. Yeah. I don't know. That just really bothered me. But going back to what you said about the perp, I'm really thinking like it's good. I'm, it's going to be Hank and like maybe they set up this whole Hank like, oh, it's Hank. Like wash our hands, done deal. And then something comes up like but just before the end of the show, like that there's I think that's Clark a good theory. Or, or they like pin it on Hank. Or they pin it on Clark, but it's been the supernatural the whole time. It could be something like that, or maybe Hank is a part of <laughs> something else, like a, a different sort of cult, and he's just maybe leading the way. Yeah, he could be involved with that uh, cult that goes back to season one yeah, that they talked about. That's possible. But it just feels like such a stray, yeah. like out of left field, like, oh, he's been there the whole time. It would okay. be a stretch. All right, sure. But explain it more, like, because the same thing with season one, like, they at least try to establish that it's been there for a while. Most yeah. of the people die off over time in that show in the first season. Yeah, yeah. But this doesn't seem like it's embellished into that community. No. But again, I think that's writing, too. That's, that's just what writing. I mean. Yeah. yeah, it's like. So, <clears throat> all right, last question, then we'll go scores. Do you think, so we, we both honestly fell off, like, and don't have great feelings about the series after this episode we're not jumping off the ship but it gives us a bad feeling after this episode if episode four feels similar do you lose all hope for the rest of the show mm, i don't i don't think i lose hope for the rest of the show i just think that the conclusion will not have a punch that it wants to be yeah you know like i think all this time is so essential to set up that haymaker that comes in the climax of these seasons and like season three i actually really enjoy but it feels a little like flat and like by the end you're just like oh man like that was good but it didn't have that gusto because i think even that season trails off a little bit and it takes a little time and stumbles along the mm -hmm. way but yeah, I don't know. I I, yeah. I I feel, and this episode is going to drop <clears throat> before uh, our Griselda review, but Griselda, Liz and I talk about in that episode specifically how the filler really caters toward and builds off of the beginning of that series and to the conclusion of it. Same exact runtime, six episodes. Mm. And that's on Netflix, which no offense to Netflix, they have some good shows, but this is HBO. Yeah. And it should be setting a different standard. And I agree with you in terms of it not having the punch, but that like these are supposed to be the episodes that are supposed to be getting you invested. Right. And I, I do think that the premiere does a does a good job of establishing the world. And I think there are moments in episode two that are really good. I still think tonally like or pacing wise, they're a little all over the place in episode two. But it's like maybe they're they're setting us up for this. And then they set us up for the worst episode by far so far of the show yeah so um i don't know i think they need to have a really big swing 100 percent in episode four yeah. and if they and again going into that one week break if you don't have a big enough swing or something to to really build off of like if you're gonna like this is the time now in episode four then if you if you want to keep doing these little flashbacks whatever like you need to have a legitimate at least 10 minute sequence. Even if you do it combined, like if you show five minutes of, of Dan versus five minutes of Navarro, like you need to have some real exposition here to get the viewers back on board and actually give a shit about the characters because the case is too, for, for something that is so otherworldly, it's mm. pretty fucking cookie cutter. Like it, yeah. it doesn't feel like there's anything that we shouldn't be expecting at this point anymore right like keep uh, you guessing yes there's no there's no guessing which is the huge problem for a crime show yeah like episode one established the world i thought they did a pretty decent job episode one two to five keep you guessing throw in a couple crazy things that happen here and there where you're like holy shit i have no idea how this is gonna end season and then the, the six is like tied up everyone's kind of in disarray like they've changed all this crap has happened but 
Yeah, I'm not feeling. And I'm so I'm I'm looking because I'm I am curious. I forget. So yes, the first. <clears throat> yeah, the other three seasons before Night Country are eight episodes, and this one goes six, mm. which is also not very good because it makes me feel like they didn't have enough story. I mean, it's showing that yeah. so far. Yeah, I'm fucking scared. I'm a little. I'm definitely skeptical. Uh, I mean, uh, I. It's just I feel like my prediction for the next episode is uh, something's gonna come out of left field. It's just gonna be a detail they find, or someone has a connection. Like maybe they'll give us what's going on with Hank before that break. But I don't know. This episode, I'm gonna go with a six as a score. I lowered my score. Okay, I'm giving it a five. Oh, you lowered it. I oh, lowered it. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, I did. I'm Damn. giving it a five. I mean, I, yeah. No, we were talking I, about I like this. Is, I, I haven't seen anything that Issa, I don't think I have seen anything that Issa Lopez had done previously to this. Um, Let's see. I'm really pulling for No, I mean, the I honestly show. haven't even heard of any of the things that she had done previously. I'm really trying. And I'm, I'm trying, trying too, but I'm not getting much uh, confidence out of this. No. I'm not. I gotta be honest. Well, that's our review, everybody. That's our cliffhanger. That's our cliffhanger for you guys. Let's see if uh, we follow through on next week's episode. Um, Let us know in the comments if you thought this episode was as bad as we did. Um, Or if you maybe thought differently. Was there something that we missed? We missed. Are we just completely missing it? Uh, Is there something um, that they were alluding to or a detail that uh, you guys came across in your findings of watching uh, True Detective Night Country, the third episode? Um, Next week, we're going to be back for episode four. Then, as we said, there's a week break. So we'll come back the following week with our reaction to episode five. And then we'll wrap it up with episode six. Um, But yeah, let us know in the comments what you guys think. Be sure to give this video a like. And if you guys don't already subscribe to our channel, we are the Culture Wave Media Network. We talk about all things in entertainment, film, and television. Please, guys, be sure to let us know what you guys think about our content. What else do you want to see from us? You guys can also follow us at Cinema Wave Media on Instagram as well as on TikTok and Facebook and Threads. We also have other accounts on Instagram as well that are at underscore culture wave media and at jersey's finest pod for our interview podcast with artists in the tri-state area just signing off i am darian scalamoni i'm zach miller and we'll see you guys next time